here. Let's move this. Get that set up. Another minute or two. So one book I want to mention to you is a scientific biography of Einstein called Subtle is the Lord. Now, first of all, that reference is not really about religion. Um, Einstein did occasionally have a few things to say about religion, but it was mostly about something he said. He was, I forget the exact details, but he was confronted with some experimental fact or preliminary experimental finding. I don't know if it was ultimately validated. And it bothered him, and he said, subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. Meaning that, you know, he thought that the nature of the universe was quite subtle, but he also believed that the universe had an underlying structural simplicity rooted in symmetry. And we're actually going to get to a little bit of that today. And this book it's called a scientific biography. There are chapters that you know talk about him as a human being. He was born in this place, and he did such and such as a kid, and here's the story of his marriage. But there's also a lot of narration of his papers. There's a lot of walking through some of his key articles and insights and explaining them at a level that you guys are ready to understand for the most part. There are pieces of it that would require more advanced physics education, but a lot of the stuff in there is explained at a level that you could begin to understand. So it's actually a really good walk through relativity. And besides relativity, some of Einstein's really important work, like his work on diffusion, his work on photons, and that's only half a joke. I got that joke from a biophysicist named Raymond Goldstein, who um, was showing some slide with diffusion on it while giving a research talk. And he said, this is Einstein's most important paper, or this comes from Einstein's most important paper, because Einstein's first piece of prominent work was actually on diffusion, and diffusion governs much of chemistry, much of biology, and anyway, with that, let's get to relativity. So last time, we discussed the fact that, um, wait, this should not be. We discussed the fact that when time differs between two observers, then distances are gonna also differ because if I think that a uh, muon took a second to get from point A to point B, and the muon thinks it took a microsecond to get from point A to point B, well, the muon and I agree on our relative velocities, so, we're going to, you know, I think that the muon moved from point A to point B. The muon thinks that point B moved towards it. If, they, if you, the muon and I disagree on the time covered, but agree on the relative velocity, we must also disagree on the distance. And so what we're going to talk about today is how distances transform between reference frames. And we're going to talk, 
about or begin to talk about the equivalence of reference frames. So let's consider two reference frames, two sets of coordinate axes. We've got the x, y, z axes and the x prime, y prime, z prime axes. And the x prime, y prime, z prime axes are attached to some other observer. They move with that observer. Think of it like drawing some coordinate axes on the floor of a train car, and then the train moves. And uh, we need to figure out how to relate measurements in one of those frames to the other. Now we said a few t classes ago that directions perpendicular to the relative motion don't change. So y prime must equal y, z prime must equal z. If somebody's going past me on a train car, um, we might disagree on distance along the velocity of the train car. So if that person's standing up, I might think the person is really narrow and they might think I'm really narrow. And so I'll think they're thinner than me and they'll think that I'm thinner than them. We'll disagree on who's skinny. Um, obviously during quarantine, we've all been eating too much. But we will at least agree on how tall each one is, right? We'll have no problem agreeing on how tall we are. All right, T prime, X prime. Well, at low speeds, Galileo had said that X prime equals X minus beta T, and that works. And he used that to explain basically why it is that we don't see the Earth moving, even though it's moving relative to the sun. So whatever formula we come up with, um, we need x prime to be proportional to x minus beta t. We might have some correction factor in there, but at low speeds, it still better be x minus beta t. Otherwise, Galileo was wrong, and that's just more than I can handle. Um, we also need it to be proportional to that rather than, it's not just proportional to that. Um, you could always say, well, fine, it has to reduce to that at low velocities, but what if it's x minus beta t plus something else? Well, the thing is that an observer had always better be at their own origin. I don't care how fast or how slow you're going. You should always set, be able to put yourself at your own origin. You should always be able to set up your coordinates so that you are at your own origin. That just means that if you're standing next to a little mark on the floor of the train that says x prime equals zero, well, no matter what we do with these coordinates, you're still at x prime equals zero. So whatever we do with my measurements of your position, whatever we do with my measurements of how long an experiment on your train took, the coordinates, of the equations that I come up with had better, using my measurements, predict that you are at your origin. So we're gonna say that x prime is some function gamma of beta, I apologize for the sloppy handwriting there, times x minus beta t. And gamma of beta is a function that we'll work out later. But when beta is small, someone tell me what gamma must be equal to, or what limit gamma must approach. At low speed, can we use Galilean physics? Darn it. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Yeah. All right. So x prime would better be x minus beta t. So what's gamma got to be equal to? About one. Very good. Harsha, as the Russians would say. Now, at low speeds, t prime equals t. But we're gonna guess that at high speeds, t prime equals gamma times t minus beta x for a couple of reasons. First of all, we've noticed that x and beta do some of basically the same things in some equations. There's some symmetry between space and time. Delta, f, delta s squared is delta t squared minus delta x squared. And also we know that the discrepancy between the timing of two events grows as the separation between two events grows. Remember the light flashes on a train? Well, within the train car, we've got a light source in the center, clocks on the left and right. And if the clocks are here and here in the train car, the light reaches them at the same time. But to an observer on the ground, the light reaches one of them earlier and one of them later. And if we increase the separation, then that discrepancy grows. So the discrepancy between two clocks 
had better grow with x. So clearly that discrepancy needs to be proportional to x. We're guessing minus beta, and we're gonna show that it works, but if you feel like, well, that's still just kind of a fortuitous guess, if we have time, we'll talk about a more rigorous way of getting this without those assumptions and guesses. All right, the other thing is that the discrepancy had better not just be proportional to distance, it had better grow with speed. At low speed, no one has ever seen two clocks unless they did very, very, very precise uh, calibration. No one has ever seen two clocks disagree at low speed. It's only at high speed. So that discrepancy had better at least be proportional to beta. It had better at least grow with beta. So we're gonna guess this. We're going to guess this form for the transformations. The other nice thing about this is that for small beta, if I just took the ratio of x prime to t prime, I'd get the ratio of x to t. All right, so we should agree on relative velocity. And now we need to determine what this gamma is. We need something in relativity that all observers can agree on. And the two most quantitative things that they can agree on are the speed of light and the space-time interval. There are other facts that we can agree on with relativistic motion, like Galileo was a prophet. We can agree that there's no such thing as motion on the 405 freeway, but these are the more rigorous facts that we can agree on. So we're gonna use the fact that delta t squared minus delta x squared must be the same as delta t prime squared minus delta x prime squared. To people in two different reference frames, have to agree on the space-time interval between two events. That doesn't mean that people in those two reference frames personally measure the space-time interval on their own clock, but you can always use your measurements to figure out what someone else would have measured if they had moved at constant velocity from one event to another. So we plug in these forms, we get a gamma squared in front of both terms, we get delta t squared, minus two beta, delta t, delta x, that's the cross term here. We get a beta squared, delta x squared. Then we get a delta x squared over here, but we're subtracting it. And we get, again, two beta, delta t, delta x, because that's the cross term. And there's a minus sign here that comes into that term, but there's another minus sign there. And so we get plus two beta delta t delta x. And over here we got minus two beta delta t delta x. And we get finally minus beta squared delta t squared. Even though this minus sign gets squared, there's a minus sign over there. So we've got delta t squared twice, once on its own and once with a minus beta squared there. And we've got delta x squared twice, once with a minus one and once with a plus beta squared. And if we put all of this together, we get the delta t prime squared minus, sorry, the, this is delta t prime squared minus delta x prime squared, excuse me. We get that this is gamma squared times one minus beta squared times delta t squared minus delta x squared. So you've got this thing on the left, equals the same thing multiplied by gamma squared times one minus beta squared. So gamma squared times one minus beta squared has to be equal to one. And then gamma has to be one over square root of one minus beta squared. Any questions? Anyone? Well, one thing we can immediately check is that if beta is very small, then beta squared is even smaller. So one minus beta squared is almost one, and the square root of almost one is even closer to one. So gamma goes to one as beta goes to zero. That means that we might be doing something right here. And these are the transformation equations that we get. That x prime is x minus beta t over this factor. t prime is t minus beta x over this factor. 
And if you don't want to work in grown-up units where C equals one, which sometimes when you have to compare with messy, dirty things like experimental data, then you'll need that one over C squared in there. The basic way to remember where uh, one over C squared should be is to just check your units. And if your units are wrong, start multiplying or dividing by C or C squared until eventually your units work. Any questions at all? One thing I just realized we should check, I forgot to put it into the notes, but we'll do it now. I will uh, share something that I can write on. We've got square root of one minus beta squared in the denominator. But when we were doing this before, we kept getting square root of one minus beta squared in the numerator. And square root of one minus beta squared could be small. So here we are dividing by a small number, whereas before- uh, Professor, yeah. I don't think we can see the screen right now. Um, I've got sharing on, um, Go up to, why is that not working? All it says is that you started sharing your screen, but it doesn't show anything. Okay, and I just got logged out of it, so. Let me rejoin this meeting from my other device. Now we're getting our feedback, so I disconnect the audio. Now I do my screen sharing on my other device. And it's still not, okay. Now do you see it? Oh uh, yeah. All right. But we're used to things like this. Delta tau equals square root of one minus beta squared delta t. So let's imagine that we go from point A to point B and um, we travel with a velocity beta, then delta t is equal to delta x over beta, or delta x equals beta delta t. Now I'm claiming that delta t prime is equal to delta t minus beta delta x over square root of one minus beta squared, and that that's also equal to delta t square root of one minus beta squared. So I can either have something with a tiny number in the denominator, or I can have something with a tiny number in the numerator. That, that probably seems really weird. Um, and I see a comment in the chat. Okay, never mind. But let's remember, that delta x is beta delta t. So let's use that fact, plug that in there, and we get that delta t prime is delta t minus beta squared delta t over the square root of one minus beta squared, or delta t one minus beta squared over the square root of one minus beta squared. And something over its square root is equal to the square root of that something. So indeed, we do get the same formula that we had last time, even though we've written it in a way that puts the square root of one minus beta squared in the denominator. Or we don't get the literal same formula, but we get something that gives equivalent predictions.
Any questions? Anyone? Coming once, going twice, three times, back to this. All right, before we were calculating um, differences in time in lots of specific scenarios. Now I want to look more at the big structure of this, the real theoretical meat of this. These equations actually look a lot like rotation equations. That may not be obvious, but you see that x prime is a linear combination of x and t with two, co with two coefficients that look like they might be very similar to each other. All right, one of them is one over the square root thing, and the other is minus beta over the same square root thing. T prime is also a linear combination of T and X. And there's an analogy with rotations, and this gets to the thing you've heard many times in popular accounts about how relativity involves a different geometry for space and time. So if we think about rotation to a different coordinate system, First we have our x and y axes, and then someone else says, no, I want to look on a different set of axes. I want to look on a set of axes that are oriented at an angle phi with respect to the original axes. So I've got x prime and y prime axes. Well, in one set of axes, x is r cosine theta and y is r sine theta. In another set of axes, x prime is r cosine of theta minus phi, this angle here. And if we use a trig identity, we get this elaborate expression, lots of cosines and sines of theta and cosines and sines of phi. But our cosine theta shows up and that's just x, and our sine theta shows up and that's just y. So we get x, that x prime is a linear combination of x and y with two coefficients that are very closely related to each other. Sine and cosine aren't equal to each other, but they have a relationship. And likewise with y prime. y prime is r times the sine of this difference in angles. We can use another trig identity and we get lots of sines and cosines of theta and phi. But we again get that y prime is a linear combination of y and x. And these transformations leave r squared invariant. They leave x squared plus y squared invariant, just like the Lorentz transformations leave delta s squared invariant. So we have something that when you change to a different way of measuring things, measuring relative to a different set of axes, it leaves something with a very nice geometric interpretation the same. In in Euclidean geometry. Likewise, in relativity, when we measure with respect to a different observer, the space-time interval remains the same, and our measurements just become linear combinations of other measurements. So instead of a rotation in Euclidean space, we have what people call a boost, meaning that they change the velocity between reference frames in relativistic space-time, and our coordinates are gamma, and minus gamma beta. And gamma and plus or minus beta gamma should be analogous to cosine of phi and sine phi. But if we take gamma squared plus beta squared gamma squared, we don't get one. So they're not quite like sine and cosine. But if we take the hyperbolic cosine and the hyperbolic sine, which I hope you saw in calculus, and if you didn't, well, don't worry, it's not going to be on the test in here, but it's some math that's worth reading up on. If we take hyperbolic sine and cosine, then we get that gamma squared minus beta squared gamma squared is indeed equal to 1. So if we just replace sines and cosines, which in trigonometry were defined with circles, they were defined on the unit circle, and replace them with things defined in terms of hyperbolas, we get some very similar geometry. Any questions? Look, deep down, every physics major, no matter how practical we all claim to be, and God knows I love practical physics, I could talk all day about optical society meetings, 
could talk all day about the physics behind medical devices, but deep down, every physics major wants to understand the weirdness behind the mysteries of the universe. And I would maintain that we need to keep that impulse in check, that we should spend more time doing things like, I don't know, inventing fluorescence microscopes that we can use to study viruses, or improving magnetic resonance so that we can do better brain imaging or so that we can do better um, organic chemistry to invent a better vaccine. I'll say all day long that we should do that. We don't want to know this stuff. So I've just told you something about the weird geometry of space and time. Somebody must have a question. Let your inner physics major come out for five minutes, okay? At the end of this class, I'll go back to scolding you about how relativity really matters for GPS and medical isotopes. Somebody let their inner physics major come out and ask a question about the weird geometry of space and time. Come on, it's okay. I promise I won't bite. I might. So just to sum up, why exactly do we do these transformations again? Oh, practical question. We do these so that we can figure out if, if somebody in one reference frame has determined the position and time of an event, I want to figure out what somebody in another reference frame would have measured. And I do that by using these transformation equations. These transformation equations will enable me to figure out what you measured if I start off with what I measured. Just like you can think of it very roughly as being like taking a little chart of time zones and figuring out, okay, if it is 1025 a.m. in Los Angeles, what time is it in Wuhan? All right, and I look at a chart and I figure that out. And so this is a more elaborate version of that, a much more elaborate version of that, but that's the idea. And it turns out that when we do this exercise of trying to figure out how one person's measurements are related to another's, we wind up with some equations that look exactly like hyperbolic geometry. Any other questions? All right, back to a more practical, well, actually still kind of fundamental point. If I want to go in the reverse direction, if I want to take your measurements and get my measurements out, figure out based on what you measured, what should my measurements be just to check and make sure that everything's consistent. So go from X prime and T prime to X and T. I have to use the exact same equations just with beta reverse. Instead of minus beta T, I get plus beta t prime. Instead of minus beta x, I get plus beta x prime. And the reason for that is that the universe doesn't have any preference between you and me. As much as I would love to think that I'm at the center of the universe, the reality is that all reference frames are equivalent. Your measurements are just as good as mine. It's a real letdown for a snob, but all measurements are equally good. And so I should be able to use the same equations to go from my measurements to yours or your measurements to mine. The only thing that will change is our relative velocity because that's something that we only agree on up to a minus sign. Now let's prove that these equations are linear because these equations are really simple. These are simple linear equations. And it seems almost too good to be true. As a matter of fact, in the 80s, when chaos and nonlinear dynamics were in vogue, there would have been somebody, no doubt, raising their hand saying, uh, Professor, so like you said that these equations are linear, but as we have learned from chaos theory, linearity is just like a simple limiting case, and the true nature of the universe is nonlinear. They were auditioning for the Jeff Goldblum role in Jurassic Park, where they were getting ready to audition for that role. Um, but it turns out that relativity really is linear, that the fundamental equations of space, of, well, general relativity is nonlinear. It turns out that special relativity really is linear. And we can prove it by remembering 
that it really shouldn't matter where we measure our origin from. Because an origin, writing down an origin is just a convenient human convention. So convenient convention, that's pretty much the definition of redundant given the root words. Anyway, let's consider three events. In one reference frame, they're all simultaneous. They all happen at t equals zero. They happen at different positions. Zero, delta, and two delta. Now we switch reference frames. So we already know that when we switch reference frames, these events probably won't be at the same time. So let's guess that t prime equals some coefficient times x to some power. And we, you might be thinking, well, doesn't t prime also depend on t? Yeah, but t is zero. So we're just going to guess that it's some coefficient times x to some power. And we're going to hope that that power isn't one because we're looking for a breakthrough, nonlinear velocity transformations. So t prime is zero. t prime a is zero. t prime b is epsilon times delta to the n. That's also the difference between t prime b and t prime a. So that's delta t prime a b. And t prime c is epsilon times 2 delta to the n, or 2 to the n delta to the n. And that's delta t prime a c. Now we had better agree that delta t a b plus delta t b c equals delta t a c. So basically all that means is that if I'm watching my clock, sitting here looking at my watch, seeing how much time elapses between A and B, taking a note, then watching to see how much time elapses between B and C. And on my other, and meanwhile, besides looking at my watch, I also had my phone out, and my phone is running its own timer from A to C. If I add up those two measurements on my watch from A to B and B to C, I'd better get the amount of time between B and C. For the same reason that if I first walk from my house to the store and then walk from the store to the dentist office, the amount of distance that I walked had better be the sum of those two distances. It doesn't have to be the straight line distance, but it just means if I count how many steps I took throughout that entire trip, now I just better add up to the steps I took in each sub-trip. It it's, seems like I'm harping on common sense right now, and that's because I am. But if we try to have nonlinear transformations, we run into problems. Because if we went to a different ref, to a, if we started our uh, timer when event B happened, we'd get the T prime A is equal to epsilon times minus delta to the n. Well, that, that's not a problem. It's not a problem that it's not zero because it happened before the reference of our timer. The T prime B is zero, and that's, that's not a problem. I mean, you start your timer at a different time, of course you're going to get a different time. But the differences have better be the same. And T prime C is epsilon times delta to the n. But now delta T prime AC, before it was 2 to the n, times t prime b, right? It was two to the n times delta, times epsilon delta to the n. Well now, it's epsilon times delta to the n, that's good, one minus minus one to the n. And there is absolutely no guarantee that this is two to the n. As a matter of fact, in almost any case, it won't be two to the n unless n equals one. So we have to conclude that um, these Lorentz transformations had better be linear. These transformations of time had better be linear. And if we did the same thing with space, we could make, go through a similar argument with space. Again, we had better get that the transformations are linear. Otherwise, you can't do common sense things like saying, well, how far did I go? First, I went half a mile to the store and then another half a mile to the dentist, so I went a mile. You wouldn't be able to make a statement like that. You wouldn't be able to say, I walked for 15 minutes and then I walked for another 30, 15 minutes, so I went 30. Questions? Questions?
I've been administering a diagnostic test to you right now, and you didn't even realize it. I've been administering the theoretical physics diagnostic test. The media gives a lot of affection to theoretical physicists, the Stephen Hawking's and Einstein's of the world, who come out as philosopher priests and make profound statements on the nature of reality and the universe. And, you know, there are some physicists who spend a certain amount of time discussing the nature of reality, but even when they discuss the nature of reality, they spend far less time saying, behold, mere mortals, I shall now prove to you that all of reality is but an illusion that depends on the geometry that you use, so that a journalist can say, wow, that's so profound. Somebody give him a book deal. We're more likely to say things like, okay, well, can we prove that these equations are linear? Can we prove that if these equations had an extra term in them, then we would violate this symmetry? Can we prove that if we were to modify the equations in this way, the results would no longer be computable? These are much more subtle things that they do. If you like these subtle things, if you like trying to come up with proofs that the equations have to have this form or else common sense breaks down, then you, should cons then you might consider theory because it's much more technical like that. It's not, behold mortals, I come here to tell you that your reality is not what you think. It's geometry is strange. While the journalists go, ooh, let's give this guy a TV show. It's much more technical. If you like that technical stuff, then you should consider theory. If you think that I've been wasting your time harping on the fact that the equations have to have this form or we can't add up time, well, then you probably don't want to do theory, and that's okay. The world doesn't need lots of people running around saying, behold, mortals, I shall now tell you the nature of reality. All right. Another fact. Events that are simultaneous in one frame aren't necessarily simultaneous in another frame. We already knew this, but we can show that these equations have that. So here's our x-axis, here's our t-axis. You can see how bad I am at drawing. Here's a set of events for which time is constant. But what is the t-axis? The t-axis, mathematically, is just a whole bunch of points that have different times with the same value of x. Well, the t prime axis must be a bunch of points that have different t prime values, but the same value of x prime, the same value of x minus vt over square root of one minus, or beta t minus, over the square of one minus beta squared. These are old notes. So this is the t prime axis. This is the set of all events that have x prime equals zero, right? And so a bunch of events that have the same value of t prime, but different values of x prime, would be these. So this line here, this diagonal line, is a set of events that are simultaneous in the other frame. Here's another set of events that are simultaneous in the other frame. And you can see that they are not simultaneous along the t-axis. And this is also like rotation. Here's a set of points that have the same value of y prime. They line up with the y prime axis in the same way. They don't have the same value along this y axis, but they do have the same value along this y prime axis. So if we synchronize our timer to event I feel like, oh, I put the papers in the wrong order. Um, any questions before we switch to an example from the book? Somebody must have a question. I guess the other thing I want to say about the nature of theoretical physics is that even when you're doing very technical things about proving that equations have to have a certain form, um, it's not always about the geometry of space-time. 
My research is on the question, like I told you a few classes a few weeks ago, what is the smallest thing we can see with light? And I showed you some slides about things you do in that research. And sometimes what I do is pretty practical. I spend my time doing calculations, figuring out, okay, well, if proteins cluster together in this way on the surface of a cell, what would the data look like? And I do that in collaboration with a friend who works at a cancer research hospital. Um, I would love to do that in collaboration with someone who works on viruses. I think it would be fascinating to do that right now. But sometimes I work on more purely theoretical stuff like I might say, okay, suppose we had an algorithm that could pull information out of this kind of data, but not pull information out of that kind of data. What limitations would that impose on an experiment? Or suppose I had an algorithm that works in these cases, but not those cases. How rapidly could I acquire data that's good enough to feed to that algorithm? And again, these are very mathematical questions. Some of them verge on things from computer science. They verge on things from the Feynman lectures on computation. Um, but they're what I actually do in my research. They're one of the more fun things that I work on in my research. And they're useful. They enable us to then design an experiment so that my friend can go and watch a cell and make the experiment run as quickly as possible, not just to be convenient in the lab, but so they can really see very rapid processes in a cell. So a lot of the time this question of, hey, if the equations have this form, or if we have the ability to solve equations of this type or express the equations this way, can impose constraints on what you do in an experiment. And that's fun. And that's a lot of what the best parts of theoretical physics are. The worst parts of theoretical physics are the same as the worst parts of any other job, trying to get things done when you have too little time and too many other tasks. But the best parts are when you try to prove that equations have to have a certain form in order to get certain kinds of information. Okay, so let's work through an example from the textbook. This is chapter five, problem R5M3. This uh, author really likes uh, Star Trek examples. Personally, I prefer Battlestar Galactica and Orphan Black, but whatever, we'll run with what this author does. And he gives you a scenario where you've got a Federation ship that is in Federation territory, and it's at rest relative to the border with Klingon space. So we're gonna say that the border with Klingon space is six light minutes away. And the Federation ship is just going to sit here. They've been ordered to resist provocations no matter what. So they sit here at x equals zero. And the Klingon ship is racing towards the uh, Klingon, racing towards the border at three-fifths the speed of light. And when the Klingon ship is, according to our coordinates, halfway between the Federation ship and the border, it fires a photon torpedo traveling at the speed of light. And the Federation ship gets hit. And then, according to us, later on, the Klingons cross the border. And this would have legal implications that the uh, Federation ship was hit while the Klingons were still in Federation space. And so the question is, from the Klingon's reference frame, were they across the border, were they at the border before or after the Federation ship got hit, all right? And so what it really comes down to is applying these transformation equations to figure out the position and time of each of these events in the Klingon's reference frame. So let's look at event C, which happens at x equals zero and t equals eight. Well, t prime C would be t minus v times x over the square root of one minus uh, v squared, where v is three fifths, t is eight, 
And this one over square root of one minus V squared, uh, let's see here, that's going to be the square root of, uh, well, one minus V squared, V is 0. 0.6. So 0. 0.6 squared is 0. 0.36. And one minus 0. 0.36 is 0. 0.64. And the square root of 0. 0.64 is 0. 0.8. So you've got one over 0. 0.8 or 1.25. By the way, you're going to notice that a lot of problems in relativity have speeds of either 3 fifths, 0.6, or 4 fifths, 0.8. And the reason is that the square root of 1 minus 0 0.6 squared equals 0 0.8, and the square root of 1 minus 0 0.8 squared equals 0 0.6, so they are really, really, really convenient. But lest you think that all of this is just professors making things easy for themselves, God knows we're lazy. Um, in a couple weeks, we will be talking about the energy of objects going very fast. And we'll look at the energy of electrons in an electron microscope used in some real biology labs. And we'll find that actually there are electrons going at speeds almost exactly 0.6 and 0.8 the speed of light in some of these electron microscopes. So these are actually realistic speeds for experiments that matter, possibly even in virology research. All right, so we plug all of this in and we get that event C happened at a time of 10 minutes. Then we look at event D, which happened at x equals six, t equals 10, but T prime D will be 10 minus the velocity times six. And if we do the math, we get that this happened at a time of eight minutes. So according to um, the Klingons in their reference frame, they were already across the border long before the photon torpedo hit and thus this changes the diplomatic protocols for retaliation. Any questions? Anyone? Then let's go to if you have no questions for me, then I can always come up with some questions for you. So let's look at, I gotta move this thing. Okay, so let's look at, these questions. Consider two blinking lights 3,000 meters apart on a railroad track. And these lights flash simultaneously in the ground frame. W is when the west light blinks and E is when the east light blinks. And the train is moving at a relativistic speed beta. And we want to know would an observer in the, tra the observer in the train passes the west light just as event W happens. Now, these things happen simultaneously in the ground frame, and they're going from west to east, okay? When does the observer on the train think that event E happened? Do they think that the east light blinked before or after? Let me give you a moment to think about that. And then we're going to discuss it. You might want to write down the Lorentz transformation equation. Okay, they claim that event E happened before. Now the author tries to do this 
in terms of these diagrams. Um, I have a different way of doing it. What I would say is that if we switch views again, and I'm gonna stop the share. All right. If we switch views again, here's event W, here's event E. XW is zero, XE is uh, 3,000 meters, which is uh, 10 microseconds. TW is zero, and TE is zero. That's what we say in the frame of the train on the ground. And now let's think about T prime W. Well, T prime W is gamma times uh, TW um, minus beta XW. But TW is zero, XW is zero, so T prime W is still zero. T prime E is gamma times TE minus beta XE. This is zero, this is 10 microseconds. So we get minus beta gamma times 10 microseconds. So what we get is that event E happened earlier in the reference frame of the train. Any questions? Then I'll give you one more question. Now we've got a bullet train moving in the plus X direction and the uh, lights on the uh, roof at the front and back blink simultaneously in the train's frame, all right? But now the question is about an observer on the ground. So what is the order of events on the ground? Now, if we think about if you think about events on the ground, or we could do back, front, XL, X prime L. Remember, we're in the reference frame of the train. X prime R equals, oh, I don't want to call the length of the train L. I'm just gonna call it delta X prime. Now, I'll, I'll just call it S is taken, T is time, so I can't use that for train. Um, R for railroad. There you go. T prime L is zero. T prime R is zero. But TL going to be gamma times T prime L plus beta X prime L. Well, you know, that's still zero. T prime R is going to be gamma times T, sorry, T R, T prime R, my bad. Well, this is zero, but X prime R is greater than zero. So we are, we're gonna get the TR is equal to gamma beta times X prime R greater than zero. 
So two events that are simultaneous in one frame are not simultaneous in the other, and the order depends on the relative direction of one train to the other. Now the question came up in the chat. Uh, the observer was standing, was the observer standing at the front or back? Whether the observer is standing at the front or back matters for when light reaches them. But remember, this observer is in a reference frame, okay? And the whole idea of a, of a reference frame is we've got a whole bunch of detectors, a whole bunch of synchronized light detectors and clocks. And all of these detectors are moving together with the train. That's the idea of being in the same reference frame. You know, if, if somebody is a million light years away, but they're not moving relative to us, they're going to receive information either way before us or way after us, depending on where that information came from, depending on where that signal came from. But that doesn't mean that they will uh, disagree with us on anything. They'll be able to put their information together with us in the end and figure it out. To take something that's a little more human scale, um, Mars is like, depending on the time of year, could easily be, I think, a light hour away. So a signal could reach Mars before Earth. But Mars is moving very slowly relative to Earth, so we can ignore relativity. So even if they got a signal relative sooner than Earth, we'd be able to put our information together with them and agree on when an event actually happened. And I am over time, so I'm gonna stop here. And on Friday, we will talk about using Lorentz transformations to handle some apparent paradoxes. Have a good day. I think I said fine.